All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the first section of uh, introduction to computer vision. So uh, the first part of today, I'm going to talk about motion and tracking, and then I, uh, uh, the second part, I will talk about a little bit about my recent research on human action recognition. Okay. So the tracking problem is the following. Now we, you know, suppose that we have a video, and in the very first frame. Someone identify the target that we want to track. In this case, it could be uh, the face of the person. And uh, over the course of the video, the person going to move into different location. He can turn his head, uh, you know, slightly, in, so it doesn't have to be uh, exactly the same appearance. But we still have to track this object. So single uh, target. Uh, uh, so this is called the single target object tracking to be uh, distinguished between the case when you have multiple targets and you want to track. Um, we want to estimate the target location in the subsequent frame given its first frame state. Okay. Now, so um, tracking has many applications. For example, in uh, for, for for video surveillance, for uh, augmented reality use. Um, if you want to to, 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 to see whether you know whether the person turn um, the camera or, or, or track you need to track the object and then build a 3d model from that right uh, tracking also very important for uh, uh, like autonomous driving or automobile uh, industry when you have to track the cars in front tracking uh, pedestrians so you can pre you know detect and predict their movement. Uh, and also tracking is also uh, you know useful for interactive display. So all um, many uh, system you rely on the ability to track some certain interact of finger or track your hands to interact with the system. But tracking itself is very challenging problem. In general, it's very challenging. First of all, there's a there's a, uh, a lot of illumination variation. Uh, now, given an, a video frame, uh, you know the next frame there might be it. It completely changes the illumination because you know, due to something like uh, visual effect of like explosion or something like that. So in this case, the illumination changes drastically. Um, another problem uh, uh, challenge in in tracking a object rotation, right? So the object. Uh, in general, uh, we we make assumption that the object is somewhat rigid, but at the same time, it's not that rigid, so it can deform. Uh, so from one frame to the next, the object doesn't change a lot. But like after let's say 50 frames, uh, uh, the pose of the object and uh, the configuration of the uh, the parts of the object can change uh, drastically, and this is this is going to cause a challenge. So essentially, if the tracker doesn't also need to get updated itself, otherwise, if you just keep the original uh, first frame, then the temp that is called the template, which is the original frame, and if it doesn't get updated, then you know soon after that, it's going to be very different from the object. So essentially, the one of the challenge in, in in tracking like how do you do? How do you update the template? How do you update the model of the object that you you need to track? Um, another uh, 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 issue or challenge of tracking a uh, you know occlusion, you know, the object uh, in uh, my uh, might be uh, you know uh, partially or fully occluded in some part of the video, and when it emerges again, we still need to track this object. So you know at some point in uh, in, in the video, you, we don't even see it at all, and then. Still, we want to maintain the association, the correspondence between the object at uh, distant time uh, apart. Right. Uh, also, uh, you might have to track something with very low resolution, uh, low resolution, like uh, let's say 10 by 10 pixel in this case. And then uh, humans are pretty good at tracking. You know, you, we we are pretty good at identifying the. Movement and then associate moving object together, but uh, uh, it's, it will be it's also challenging for computers to do so. Right. 
Uh, another uh, issue is uh, background clutter. You see that in this case, we need to track uh, in a car, but uh, at night time, you know, all you see is uh, the, the light at the back of the car, and then it can be confused with many the headlights or many other street lights. So uh, there's a lot of like, detraction, a lot of things that look similar to the object that you want to track. Uh, scale invariance is another challenge, you know, uh, because we have a perspective camera when the object moving from far away to closer, the scale will change drastically. So in this case, we need to uh, the model need to also the reason you know to to enlarge it, and so it cannot have a fixed size template to track for the object. Okay, so those are the few challenges of tracking. So let's talk about uh, you know the problem formulation and how tracking is uh, is normally addressed. Uh, yeah, so okay. Now tracking is usually posed as an optimization problem. So essentially, uh, given a model of the object, the model here could be, let's say the simplest one is a template. You have a, 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 a template which is show you the appearance of an object, and you want to find in the next frame the one that you know, match with that template as, as, as the best one that match with that template. Okay? So essentially, there's a function uh, that tell you, okay, suppose, okay, so uh, W here could be, say, the object appearance at the previous frame, and X uh, here is among the set of all possible hypotheses in the next frame that you can evaluate, and among that, you find the one that most correlated with the, uh, the, the current frame. So that's going to be the location of the object in the next frame. It's uh, pretty much like uh, like uh, yesterday we talked about uh, detection. So okay, so we have a classifier, we have a model, and then in the uh, for detection we have to come up with a set of hypotheses and then evaluate individual one. Okay, and to figure out here we also have to evaluate multiple hypotheses, but we only want to keep the best one, the one that maximize the uh, similarity between the hypothesis and, and the, uh, the model or the template in this case. One very simple function, uh, and there's many functions that you can use to measure the similarity between a hypothesis and the template. Okay, one very simple one is uh, based on a linear function, or you can take the correlation between the previous frame and the next frame, okay? Um, so how do you learn, but, but, but the function that you uh, use to compare the uh, hypothesis with the model doesn't have to be, now it could be the L2 distance between them, it could be the normalized correlation, it will be correlation. In general, you can also learn this function. So essentially, uh, the task is suppose how do you learn to discriminate or distinguish between the correct target and the, um, the other ones that not supposed to, uh, to match it. Uh, in this case, for example, essentially what we want is we have a classifier that tells, oh, is this a target uh, or not? And you can, you can consider it as a binary classification problem between the ones that should be matched and the ones should not be matched. Now, so, uh, so in general, this can be uh, posed as an like optimization problem. And when an optimization problem, we want to look at the uh, the surface of this optimization problem, and say, for example, uh, the surface of uh, this, you want to look at the surface of the function, and suppose that you want to optimize this function, then essentially you want that the global minimum or even the local minimum of this function correspond to the one that you actually want, which is, uh, in this case, uh, remember the last time I talked about the maximizer function, but in optimization we tend to say it's a minimization problem. So think about this: it's the energy function, or you you you, you try to maximize the correlation, min, minimize the negative correlation. Okay, so let's think about so that I just flip the function upside down. So what we want is the correct location, a uh, um, or the, the target at the next frame is actually correspond to the minimum of the function. That is what we want. Um, 
So there's a one uh, approach called the discriminative correlation filters, and it uh, is, is formulated in the following. Now, I want to learn a function f to evaluate my multiple hypotheses uh, here. Uh, and the function f is the hypothesis it acts, and the, the model or the thing that we need to learn is w. And what we want to learn a uh, okay, if this is the surface, uh, uh, the error surface that we want, then I want to learn W to, uh, to use this as a target and learn a function to map Fx to this target. Does it, uh, did I make it clear? There's a, there's a desired function that I want. I want the function to have the local minimum at the location where I want it to be. All right? Um, Okay, so um, let me say it again. There's a function, and uh, we want a, to learn a function um, that has the properties that the minimum of the function correspond to the target, the location of the target. To learn this function, we can set it up as a regression problem, a linear regression problem, where the target is the error function, the, the the desired error function that we have, and the input is you know uh, uh, multiple hypotheses around the uh, the target. Uh, not sure this point is clear. Did I make it clear, or is there any question here? Yes. Yes, actually the feature, but like say each, uh, let's say for each location, one each possible location of the object, uh, there's one feature vector coming out from that location. And then given the feature vector, you can evaluate, okay, how well it match with my model, right? So, um, so what we want, sub given training data, let's say we have training data, we want to learn a function f to so that the error surface look like this. And yi is the target, which is the value of the function we already know. Hi we also know, because we know the location of the object. So all we need to learn is to learn of uh, the function f to map from uh, hi to yi. And the simplest function, or one of the simple function is uh, the linear function. And this term is the regularization term, and this corresponds to something called the re 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 regression, okay? So the objective function is read regression. And, uh, all right, so the nice thing about this formulation is, uh, is uh, it's, it's a convex uh, quadratic problem, and it has closed form solution. So actually the matrix where each column is a vectorized image region, basically. And Y is the ground truth Gaussian label. So we want the surface to look like a Gaussian so that when we minimize it, we get to the um, local minimum and then it should be the location of our target. And W is called the correlation filter weight. And the nice thing about this formulation is that it has a closed form solution. Essentially, you can, uh, you know, the best uh, vector W, if you uh, minimize this function, can be found using this closed form solution. And this is a very nice property, all right? Now, the problem is this, even though we have a closed form solution, here we need to invert a very, uh, inverse, a, a very, uh, very big matrix. So remember, actually, a, of uh, a, 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 a two-dimensional matrix where the, um, the number of rows is the size of the uh, feature vector, and this feature vector can have high dimension. So in this case, uh, we have to invert something very big, okay? So which is not, very, uh, not good because in tracking, typically you want to do it very fast and imagine that you have to do this for every single frame. So it's going to be very slow. However, uh, um, P 
people uh, found out that the, the, uh, the, the matrix X it actually has some specific structure. And in this case, they call it, uh, it has the circular structure. Essentially, uh, remember that we have a, um, um, I'm going to use a what? So, okay, so uh, now suppose that uh, we have two frame, this is one, this is frame attempt, uh, uh, right? so this is T plus one, and this is time T, okay? There's an object that you want to track in this frame, and uh, you, you want to know where it moves in the next frame, right? So that's the problem of uh, tracking. Now the one that for uh, for correlation filter we want to learn an error function so it helps us to evaluate multiple hypotheses in the next frame. Yes, if you have a function f, uh, f, okay. So in the next frame you're going to do you know you're going to evaluate multiple location and the one that minimize the function f of x. Or, or, I'm sorry, uh, minimize or maximize this function is going to be the one that you're going to take at the location of the next, uh, of, uh, sorry, it, you want to take it the location of the object in the next frame, right? So is, is the function f of x, which is w transpose x, and its location here is a vector x, a feature vector correspond to it. Yeah, so, so in general, so it's the maximization problem when you want to maximize. Now, to learn this function f, we need to learn w. And how do we learn w? Oh, all right, sorry. Uh, so how do we learn w? Um, so to learn w, we need to learn it from this, uh, this frame t. So one way is, okay, I'm going to use multiple kind of negative sample around my target sample here. Each of them should map to, let's say, very simple one. The correct one should map to zero as one. The ones next to it or you know, different from it should be mapped to zero. Let's make it simple. It's one or zero. So it is a learning function where you learn from the current frame itself to the surface, the error surface of either zero or one. Yeah. Does it, uh, did I make clear? All right, so, so this is the function we have to learn. So each location here, there is some value called xi, which is the feature vector uh, at that particular location. And when you stack all of these feature vectors together, you have x, you know, x1, x2, and xk, let's say. This is all the vector here, okay? And the target is y1, uh, y, K, and most of them are zero, but except only the one that correspond to the exact uh, location object A1. And uh, for the case of, uh, uh, if we, we you read regression, since this, this problem A can be, in, uh, it uh, has closed form solution, but still it, uh, you have a big matrix that you need to inverse. However, uh, the matrix X here has some uh, certain structure. It goes circular matrix. It's essentially, you can see that, you know, if you just move it like one pixel to the left or one pixel to the right, the matrix doesn't change a lot. So essentially, the value is kind of, you know, you just ship it uh, one, uh, a few value every time you move it, all right? So, um, so, yeah, so this is the matrix for uh, the circular structure for one dimensional. So I just show it for one dimension. So essentially, you can see that there's a vector, and you, you move it to the next location. It has been uh, 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 shifted in you know, this one, go to the, this one, and everything else is shifted up a little bit, and then so on, so forth in the next one. Now, if the matrix has this particular structure, then it actually has very... Um, nice uh, properties that uh, you don't have to do the inverse uh, of this matrix, but uh, you can do it very efficiently using uh, through the Fourier domain. So essentially, you can transform 
uh, it can be done by uh, taking the Fourier transform of uh, the vector x and the variable y, and then this is the formulation to compute the Fourier um, the correlation filter in the Fourier domain. And all you need to do is take the inverse Fourier transform and then you uh, figure out the, uh, the W uh, matrix, okay? So because of this, it means that every step, you can retrain the correlation filter, you can retrain the W uh, you know, very fast. So, and you use it to apply in the next frame to track the location of the object. Yep. Um, so uh, yesterday I also talked about uh, convolution. Uh, well, correlation is similar to convolution and is related to, to, to Fourier transform. And in this particular case, when you have a circular matrix, then uh, this can be done very uh, efficiently. All right. Uh, is there any question on this? Hi, uh, I am just curious why this error function corresponds to the current frame, uh, because you were computing from the current frame. Uh, is is it why this error function a correspond to the current frame, current not frame, not 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 the next frame? The next frame because we don't know the next frame yet. All we have is okay. I how do I prepare myself for the next frame? So I learn a function to distinguish myself from my neighbors, basically. So I have a target location, is location. I move a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and I say, okay, I want to distinguish myself from this example. There's something close to me, but you know, I still don't want to be them. Okay? So I learn the correlation, the weight doctor, so to distinguish the correct one from the one surrounding. So that is the, the learning problem that I want to do. And well, the assumption is in the next frame, I can use this function to evaluate the hypothesis. But yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it has some assumption that like, you know, the object, say, doesn't, uh, doesn't change a lot from one frame to the next yet. Yeah. Which is, is generally true if you... Uh, uh, if you assume that you have, you know, uh, if not, like suddenly become something totally different, right? Yeah, my actually area is text classification, which little bit maybe analogies with this one as well. So I just assume how would you, maybe from a toy example, local minimum and global minimum, could you please, from the, this diagram, I couldn't, I mean, because there is a bounding box. The upper one you are talking, you were talking about uh, this local minimum and max lo uh, global minimum. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> this so could be a very little question. So, 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 so here, here's uh, the thing, okay? So at the current frame, I am at the current location. I want to distinguish myself. I, l I want to learn a, a function to distinguish myself from my neighbors. And this uh, target could be, I can set it up as a classification problem where the value for myself is one, everyone else, you know, zero, okay? Or I can, so that the target function is either zero or one, but I can also have a target function, it's a smooth Gaussian, because, okay, so in this case, say, okay, if he is close to me, then I give him like yeah, one minus zero, one. If very far away, I give him one minus five, something like that. So the further away from me, I want the target to be uh, smaller. So it incorporates how close the neighbor to me. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. So um, in order to localize the frame in the next step, and you are using the Fourier transform, I am wondering that um, in the Fourier transform that they have the equation right from the time domain to frequency domain, but uh, how do you make sure that um, to be like the, to be localized with the frame? Um, I don't, I cannot imagine that how, how to, how to apply the Fourier transform to tell you that it is the localization of the previous frame and next frame. Um. 
Uh, so I think the, the question is uh, like when you have the model, how do you evaluate it on the next frame? Is that? So the, the I'm, I'm, I'm not sh quite sure. Uh, there's two steps. One is to learn the filters. Okay, learning the filter, you can put, go into the Fourier domain, uh, and then when you learn the W, yes, you can. Let's say you do the inverse Fourier transform to get back W. Inverse Fourier transform. Yes. Okay, and for the next frame. What you can do is using W to like let's say exhaustively search all the hypotheses in the next frame. So it's two step. One a uh, learning the function, the tracking a correspond to optimize the function, and optimize the function can be done exhaustively, let's say. Yes, yeah, so 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 essentially or or you can use say that you know if you that use Translation, then it just do the uh, correlation filter in the next frame to figure out. But in in, in practice, you need to do both uh, handle both uh, uh, scale uh, variance to uh, also aspect ratio. So you want to enlarge the search space. What I'm talking about to how to learn the function to evaluate it. But for searching for it, you can let's say you know simple way or the intuitively simple is to do exhaustive search around the location that you need to perform. All right. Um, any other question? Uh, Hi. Right. Um, oh. Yeah, who, so. Who, who, who? OK. <laughs> so. Yes. So X is representing an image, right? And um, I don't see how is that related to a circular structure. X is uh, representing an uh, uh, is the feature vector of a patch. Okay, so each uh, I here correspond to uh, one particular region. So. I am myself right here. So my next, uh, my neighbor is also H, uh, H1, uh, another label H2, another one H10, okay? So the circular structure in the sense that H2, it differ from H1 a little bit. Yes, you, you might be, you know, thinking about the boundary cases, you know, when I overlap N minus one and the remaining is a little bit different, but in general, they just assume it is circular structure, okay? Okay, any other question? Um, all right, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, all right, so um, um, so this, uh, this set of work is actually quite, uh, quite recent, and then uh, three years ago, there's a paper called CMS Network for Tracking. By the way, the first time I heard the word uh, CM is, I was, I was very confused, right? So uh, I don't know uh, many times that I just uh, click on the dictionary to find out oh, what that means. You know, I know what it means, but I didn't want to see if it has any other meaning. And then uh, the dictionary only gave me one meaning. So I was very confused uh, by that. Um, it's the same with like uh, when I was very small, there's a problem, they call it the, the Tower of Hanoi, and then I don't know where it came from. There's no tower like that in Hanoi. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, um, well, so, but, uh, uh, but the CMS network is essentially, there's a network that is shared. Uh, it, 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 it has two branches, and they are conjoined with each other, and they share between um, 
a single network being applied to two different samples, and then you want the output of it to be either different or the same. Okay, so in this case, the author proposed something. Uh, you know, it's just the, to apply uh, correlation filter on top of the deep learning features. So essentially, what they want is what they want. Uh, the co correlation filter I already explained in the previous step. Now, instead of applying it on the original space, right, they want to apply it on the feature space. Um, uh, so that's that all this paper about. Okay, apply correlation filter on the uh, feature space, uh, and the features has been learned in the you know. Uh, the feature he essentially is being attracted by a network train on the image net, the, the one that had been trained uh, for object recognition. Remember that we talk about uh, using the uh, network train on a thousand classes, uh, one, one million images as a feature attraction. And this is one example of how to use it for tracking. Well, so uh, the next paper, the author said, okay, we don't want. Uh, uh, to learn, you know, what we want is we want to end-to-end -end learning framework where we can also fine-tune the feature, uh, the, the network for the feature attraction. So, uh, what they propose is, you know, instead of using a pre you know, uh, a, a, a pre network using it as a feature attraction, they also learn the CNN to attract the features uh, maps. And then, uh, using the correlation filter uh, uh, the end to actually um, do the tracking. So the novelty of the paper in, in, in many uh, uh, in computer vision in many papers in the last few years are actually how to um, move from uh, traditional computer vision to deep learning, uh, doing deep learning. And one crucial step in doing deep learning, you need to figure out how to do gradient descent or how to compute the gradient, how to do back propagation in the network. Okay? So what this paper said, okay, uh, the correlation filters that we I showed you earlier using through the Fourier transform, using the uh, inverse of a, a, um, of a, re a regression pa uh, paper, it's not easy to compute do the back propagation, and so they come up with or they derive the formulation to how to perform back propagation using uh, through Fourier domain. So that is uh, the technical novelty of the paper, and this is the architecture that they propose. All right, and uh, very recently, two months ago, there's a paper called CM Mask. That's like uh, how you go from faster RCNN to mass RCNN. This paper say, okay, not only I can uh, predict the bounding box, I can also uh, predict, uh, you know, learn a function to predict the mask of the object. All right. Even though in the very first frame uh, we started with uh, uh, the bounding box initialization for the target, but it also output the mask uh, of the object that we need to track. All right, so here's uh, some of the results that uh, show uh, the paper, uh, show in, in, in their paper. Uh, so you can see that the initial, uh, the initial frames that you have to track is, is that initiate, uh, you know, you draw the bounding box of the object you have to track, and then over time it's going to track the object uh, and give you the mask for the object, all right? Uh, one uh, nice library that you can download and play around with is the library by uh, uh, Centam Group. They they have uh, uh, they have implemented uh, CM Mask, which is this one. They also have their own uh, method for tracking. Uh, so the library is uh, I I play around with it and it's very it's very good. So you can use it for doing research in this area too. Okay, so this uh, I think this is a simple example when you have a, a not not so simple I say. Okay, um, so this is the footage uh, that I took at um, Inchen uh, Inchen uh, Airport. There's a robot moving around, and then I use this for tracking the head uh, of this robot. In this case, it worked pretty well. Okay. 
this is uh, my son. I'm tracking him. <laughs> so, um, oh, oh, he stole it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. We got it back. Okay, anyway. Um, oh, hang on. Here's, uh, uh, here's the, on uh, the chaotic scene of Hanoi. Uh, so, you know, tracking this guy would be uh, easy. So I'd like to tr see if it can track this person here, okay? But, um, so one problem of tracking is when the person is out, is occluded and not seen, then it loses the track, right? So in this case, it, uh, but it still try to maintain it. Uh, at the end, it actually get back to that person. So somehow it's pretty good. All right. All right. Um, okay, so, um, so what I just talk about so far is single target tracking. And uh, toward the end, I show you one particular example when I have to track my son and then at some point it switched to another boy, right? So in this case, it's a... Uh, a different problem is called multiple target. You have multiple target. Before we have a single target, we try to train a classifier to distinguish ourselves from our neighbor. But what if our neighbor are similar to us of the same class? You know, they all people, like all pedestrian, all cars. Then in this case, this uh, approach do not, uh, doesn't work very well, as one of the examples that you saw with my son. Okay, so. Uh, now I'm going to talk about multiple target tracking and it means you have multiple target and you want to track and the next level could be dense pixel tracking it means like you want to track the movement of every single pixel and this is called optical flow so I don't have time to talk about optical flow but I'm going to give you a very brief uh, introduction on multiple target tracking okay okay so multiple target tracking so the assumption here is there's some certain class of uh, object that you want to track. And you already run a detector and you identify the location and also kind of the, of the, the confidence of the detector at every single frame. So now you have multiple detections, for example, multiple detection of uh, like players or people here and so for each detection, you have the H1, uh, you, you know the bounding box, you know the frame in this frame, and also there's some scores that return the confidence how likely it is actually a true detection. It's coming out from the classifier. So okay, um, uh, usually the detection, no matter how, uh, it's it actually uh, usually not perfect. Okay? So in many cases. Uh, there are many four positive, let's say, these uh, or uh, you know some things that do not correspond to the right target people, uh, and also it has a misdetection to you know it doesn't detect this person or this person here, so uh, there are two problem, four positive and misdetection that we need to handle. So for example, yesterday I show you the case when I apply hand detection on. Uh, on video, so uh, and during that vi in this video I show it's it called a frame by frame detection and no tracking or no temporal smoothing. Now, so how can uh, what can we do? Can we use few? Uh, so the approach that I just told you about using correlation filtering is part of something called the filtering approach. Uh, Filtering means uh, you do recursive Bayesian estimation. You, uh, you have a model for it, and then you keep updating it given a new observation, new frame. And this is a term coming from signal processing. Essentially, you estimate the state of the system given all the measurement up to the, the, the current frame. Uh, so, so filter means filter out the correct state from the noisy observation that where the names come from. Uh, but however, recursive filtering doesn't work for, uh, for multi-target setting because there's a tendency to jump between similar target and identity swap, uh, right? And it, also, in many cases, if you want to do real-time, you know, you want you process a signal, then you cannot look back and change it. 
for the tracking problem, sometimes you, you, you just want, you have a video and you do it, offline processing, you can go back and forth to, to, do, uh, to link the detection together. You don't have to do it in one pass. That's what I meant. So uh, another approach to multi-target tracking is uh, through like data association or like discrete, combinat discrete combinatorial optimization. So the definition is uh, you have a method aimed to formulate the problem such as uh, uh, finding the track, uh, linking the detection into track. All right. Uh, so the strategy is given a similarity or distant function in terms of target appearance, motion, and contextual property. Tracking can be formulated as matching similar object occurrences uh, <coughs> across video frames. So uh, the, the step in multi-target tracking usually have the following steps, okay? So uh, first of all, uh, actually the, second, uh, the first step is you have to define a function to score or to evaluate how good a set of tracks are, okay? You know, how do you evaluate the fitness of, you know, how do you call this a good track and, you know, or given a set of track, how do you say, okay, these are the reasonable set of tracks of object and this one is better than the other one. So you have to come up with some function to do the evaluation, okay? Now, the second step, uh, which is actually, uh, the first step is the middle, basically. The second step, one, you have the cost function. Uh, of all the detection, you have multiple frame. Each frame have multiple detection. You have to put them into tracks. And so essentially, it is, an, uh, is, an, is, is a combinatorial optimization problem, given the objective function that you have to maximize the utility or minimize you know, the compatibility of, of the tracks. Okay? So there's two, two main problems. Uh, uh, you know, coming up with the right cost function. Second, one, you have the cost function, how do you optimize this? There's so many possible ways that you can combine multiple detection to the, together. How do you do? Okay. And just like for detection, the final step, it could be some using some other heuristic or context to, element, uh, to, to, to reduce uh, uh, the, the, the ID switch problem to kind of pre-scoring it or whatever. But the main step is, um, I would say, uh, solving the associate problem and assigning the cost. Okay, so the problem formulation for, um, for assigning, uh, for, 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 um, uh, for the assignment, assuming that you already, you already have the cost function, okay? The problem is you have multiple frame. Each frame, you have multiple detection. How do you partition the detection into like K tracks, okay? So that each track is correspond to you know, one single object. And usually, uh, given the cost function, it can be uh, uh, formulated as an, another optimization problem, and then you have to go through associates. Okay, so this is track S1, S2, S3. Each track, the track are disjoint, so you assume that you know, uh, each track corresponds to an object, so they should not have any shared object in it. And each object is associated with only one track, one and only one track, okay? Maybe some object is not associated with any track, but uh, uh, hmm, hmm, okay. Um, and then uh, you, you optimize for this. Um, um, one, one particular approach in this is you can consider multiple detection uh, and frame as a graph. It's a graph through time. So the nodes are the detection. Okay, the edges are the ones that connect from one frame to the next frame, right? So typically, you can say that from one frame to the next frame, every detection from frame T can be connected to every detection in frame T plus one. And the problem the now is try to find uh, the path through the graph or multiple path through the graph to link the detection together, to connect all the nodes together. So you have a set of uh, detection and the set of vertices of the graph is the union of all the nodes and the edges are the ones that link uh, consecutive uh, uh, 
uh, nodes of consecutive frame together. And then the task is to find um, uh, multiple paths through the graph, right? Well, they actually, uh, so this area, there's many approach has been proposed to do this. In general, this is a, uh, is a combinatorial problem with a very, uh, so there's a, we need to make a lot of uh, assumptions. So essentially, the cost function is usually taken in the form of you only evaluate the confidence of the node and then the edge potential. So it corresponds to only unary and binary potential. So in this case, you can optimize this function quite uh, uh, efficiently. If you have a higher order uh, interaction between the detections, then it becomes a harder optimization problem. But there's several approaches, or you know, I would say many approaches, uh, many formulations have been proposed. Um, yeah. Uh, so the associated problem is provided the cost function how to find all the trajectory of all frame in uh, in reasonable or polynomial time or uh, globally optimal. Uh, the constraint at the nodes should be di uh, are disjoint and uh, simple. And then uh, there's a set of papers that talk about you know uh, propose different way to do the optimization given given the set of detection. Uh, in general, as I said, it's usually formulated at the graph uh, problem when you start with the starting node, it's like the source node, and then the sync node, and then the graph, and then finding the kind of is the maximum flow between the graph of five k path to, uh, to 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 through the graph. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I want to talk about. Okay, let's skip it. Anyway, so uh, uh, how to assign the cost function? Uh, again, there's a multiple uh, kind of heuristic to assign the cost function. One, a uh, it, you can define the cost based on the motion, uh, based on the appearance. Let's say from one frame to the next, I want to match the ones with the closest appearance to me, for example. Uh, you can define the cost based on the features. So, uh, deep sort, for example, you can provide a library function where you can provide the feature vector for all detection, and it try to match uh, the feature vector between um, a consecutive frame. Uh, okay, so. There's a set of paper now. So in this area, I um, I don't want to give you a wrong direction here, but uh, I do some uh, uh, search myself to find it, which which one is the best uh, library to use and what is the most one to use in in practice. I I have to say that I fail to see something that work really well or very robust. You know, work right uh, out of. Uh, uh, when you download it, it can work uh, well right away. Uh, if I have to recommend anything, then probably this library is uh, it pretty easy to set up and run, but at the same time, it's not as uh, um, you know well rounded as some of the other libraries that I showed you earlier, like for the single target tracking or for uh, object detection that I showed you yesterday. Okay. But if you need to start from somewhere, you just see one of the libraries that you can start with. Okay, so um, as I said, I, uh, want the last part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about human action recognition. So I don't want to, uh, I, I don't have time to uh, have talk more on it and also on uh, dense optical flow. For dense optical flow, uh, I recommend you to, uh, you know, I myself you open CV and then there's a uh, library function called, uh, if you have CUDA uh, and GPU, you can use some of a function called dense optical flow method of open CV4 and in that it has uh, a method that we tend to use is TVL1, which is, uh, this, uh, in that they have several implementation of open uh, dense optical flow. One is the Fernback, one is uh, Brox method and TVR1, and uh, I and my student tend to use the TVR1 method if you know what it is. Okay. 
All right, so let's, uh, uh, for the remaining uh, part today, I want to introduce a little bit of my, my research. Um, so you can, uh, all right, so in, uh, I'm interested in human behavior analysis and uh, one of, uh, for example, given a video, I want to uh, recognize the action, interaction, and activity of the people in this video. Uh, by human behavior, I also mean the facial behavior given a, a video. I want to understand how happy or how depressed this person is. Uh, okay, I'm also interested in attentional behavior. Essentially, what part of an image or video attract visual attention? And how do I predict and manipulate visual attention? So, by analysis, I mean the problem of recognition and prediction. Now, recognition means uh, recognize something that already happened in the past, given a, a, a video, recognize what occurred in the video. Prediction is given what happened until now, I want to predict the future. But prediction is a difficult problem because human behavior is very stochastic. So another problem that I'm interested in is called early recognition. Recognize an ongoing activity. So the activity has already started, but it hasn't finished yet, and we want to recognize this activity as early as possible. Uh, so why should we care about human behavior? I think for this audience, I, I can just skip all of this. All right, anyway. So, uh, so human behavior analysis, so the main problems that I'm interested in are recognition, early recognition, and prediction of human action, face behavior, and visual attention. I'm also uh, interested in some supporting problem like uh, detecting humans and human body part in images. So yesterday I showed you the work on hand detection. Another area that I'm interested in is crowd counting. Given an image, we want to estimate how big the crowd is. Now, uh, much of my research is initiated by, uh, in, uh, by application of computer vision, but uh, it is driven by the fundamental problem in machine learning. So, so in this area, the type of data that you have is uh, usually very limited. You have uh, mostly unlabeled sample or the annotated sample you have are often weak and noisy. So how do you learn from unlabeled, weakly labeled, or noisily labeled data? Uh, and uh, because you have a lot of other sample, a lot of other information, how you learn from complementary sample. So this area you also requires some, uh, uh, you know, an approach with interdisciplinary uh, investigation. So I often collaborate with people in uh, psychology and uh, psychiatry, and so we look at the problem in human behavior, perception, and learning. Okay, so today uh, what I'm going to tell you is, is one piece of my work on recognizing human action and how to use this uh, complementary sample. Um, so this is uh, based on two pieces of work on, uh, on a CVPR 18 called pulling, uh, pulling action out of context and one uh, called attentive action and context factorization. All right, so the goal here is to uh, recognize human action and uh, say the type of action that we could be something like run, drive, and kiss. Now, human action recognition is actually very challenging due to the subtlety of human action and the complexity of video space. So it's usually very difficult to identify and attend to the relevant information in the signal or in the video. So a common approach for human action recognition would be the following. Now, you collect some positive and negative data, and you train a classifier to separate between positive and negative data. For example, you consider training a KISS classifier. We can collect a bunch of uh, examples of a KISS. And then you consider other type of human action at negative example. And once you have these two set of example, we can train a, a picture of favorite classifier and train to separate between these two sets. The problem is, uh, usually in the set of positive example, not only you have the action, but also you also see something I call the context. Now, uh, for example, in the case of uh, 
uh, a kiss. Usually, when they film a kiss, they usually have very slow moving camera panning around the two couple kissing. So essentially, the classifier learning the camera motion instead of the motion of a kiss. Okay. So by context here, I mean that there, there are various types of context. So it could be the background context, like a kiss is more likely to occur in a living room. Uh, it could be camera context, a slow panning camera, and it could be a situation context, like a kiss is more likely to occur after a dance. Right. Now, context often co-occur with the action, and uh, context is useful for recognition, but at the same time, if the learned classifier focuses on the contextual cues instead of the action content, then it will not uh, generalize to the situation where the context is different. For example, if uh, the classifier to recognize uh, um, a brush, brushing teeth and then all the brushing teeth actually occur in the bathroom, then it won't be able to recognize it outside the, the bathroom. So our goal in this work, a uh, we want to learn us uh, uh, have a method that separate uh, uh, for for action recognition that uh, explicitly separate the action from the context. Now the technical challenge here is uh, context is always co-occur with the action. So to some extent, it's impossible to uh, use this approach. Uh, if you just have two sets to separate between the, the action and the context. Now, at this point, I should uh, also mention that in a video, not only you have the action component, the context component, but you also have something uh, I would refer to noise. Noise is something that kind of independently occur in each, uh, each video, so if you have a lot of training data, you can suppress the noise, okay? You can uh, emphasize the signal and suppress noise. But in the case of context, because it always co-occur with the action, so even if you have uh, a lot of training example, it's, uh, it, it's not possible to separate between um, action and context. Now, so one approach, a uh, we can uh, provide detailed annotation for uh, the data sets that we have. So given a uh, action uh, a video clip, we can ask someone to annotate, you know, where what part of the video correspond to uh, the action and what part correspond to the context. But this approach is, um, but uh, it, 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 this is, is, is problematic because first of all, it's a laborious process. Imagine that you have to provide a detailed annotation for. Uh, you know, thousands of example of thousands of classes. So, so this approach is unscalable. But uh, another problem of this approach is, is, is very ambiguous. So, uh, if I ask you, uh, what would you consider the temporal extent of a handshake? Okay, is, is this when two hands, the two hands are in contact, or when one person start extending the hand toward the second person? So, if I ask multiple people to annotate the handshake then I'm, 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 it's li very likely that I'm going to get different annotations, very uh, inconsistent with each other. Okay? Um, so our idea in this work is the following. So, um, well, so in, uh, in addition to having the action sample, what I want to do is consider something called, I call the conjugate sample. A conjugate sample is something that contextually is similar to the action sample, but it doesn't contain the action, right? So, uh, so the differences between the action sample and the conjugate sample would be the action component itself. And uh, the conjugate sample, by definition, is contextually similar to the action sample. So if you can extract the similarity between the two samples, then you can figure out the context component. So given a conjugate sample and an action sample, by uh, finding out the differences and similarity between them, we can uh, isolate or you know, distinguish between the action and the context component. So how do I obtain conjugate samples? So, um, so suppose this is the video and we have uh, the annotated action in the middle. So this is the action sample. So in this work, what we assume is 
the video that precedes or follows the action is the conjugate sample. So the video that right before or after the action is actually you know, contextually similar to the action sample because it contains the same set of people and the same background, but at the same time, it doesn't contain the action. All right? So uh, to some extent, what we propose here is to use the data before and after the action sample for, and use it for the training our uh, classifier. Now note that in this case, uh, we propose to use more data, but we don't require to use more annotation. Usually in uh, human action recognition, uh, to collect the data, what people do is they only like truncate or clip the video at the location of the action and all the, you know, the data surrounding the action will be thrown away. So what we propose here is do not throw away the data, but use it for training. So, uh, but we do not require more annotation effort than other, other um, approaches. Okay, so now that uh, we have some conjugate samples, how do we use it effectively? Well, uh, there are several possible approaches that we can use to, uh, uh, to, 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 to compare and contrast these two, uh, uh, two, two samples. One is we can use to subtract the conjugate sample from the action sample. Now, but the problem with this approach is there's no direct pixel-to-pixel -pixel correspondence between the two samples, so direct subtraction wouldn't work. Uh, the second approach is to uh, use conjugate sample as negative examples. However, this actually ignores the importance of context, uh, context for recognition. So we want to explicitly separate the, uh, the, the context from the action, but we do not want to ignore the importance of context for recognition. And the third approach is to use conjugate sample as positive examples. So in this case, essentially what we, uh, we, we have is noisy labels because the conjugate sample does not contain the action. Okay, so this is the proposed uh, framework here uh, for separating action from the context. Now, so we have an action sample and we have a conjugate sample. Uh, here, we're going to train a network F, a CNN uh, uh, that apply on a video clip, uh, and then it's going to output a feature vector. All right? If I apply it on an action sample A, I get our FA. If this, given the same network applying on conjugate sample C, I get FC. Okay? Uh, we're going to say that because the action uh, sample and the conjugate sample are, are, do not contain the same action, so we want FA and FC to be different. So we can penalize for the similarity between FA and FC. At the same time, we can to learn a context, a context extractor of, uh, network G, and when we apply G on the action sample, we get GA. Apply on the conjugate sample, we have GC. And uh, since we assume the conjugate sample is contextually similar to the action sample, then we can penalize for the differences between the uh, GA and GC. Right? Now here, so we have two networks, one to extract the action component, one for extracting the context component. And uh, we want to use both of them for classification, so we can fit both of them into a classifier H, and then we can learn the classifier by minimizing the classification loss. Okay, so this is the framework for joy learning of the action extractor F, the context extractor G, and the classifier H. So this uh, network has like, uh, um, sorry, this architecture has three networks, and there are three loss functions that they are all will be trained uh, together. Okay, so for testing, uh, we don't need the conjugate sample. We already have the action attractor and contact attractor. We can fit the video clip into this network and then through the classifier and then get out the uh, classification output, right? Um, the nice thing about this framework is it enables detailed analysis. So one, because we have uh, an explicit separation between the action and the context, we can ask the question, we can 
analyze the contribution of the action factors, and we can also analyze the contribution of the context factors, right? By uh, essentially by switching up or suppressing uh, the the crest, you know, the other branches. So in summary of our approach, um, what we propose is a method that sep uh, separately model the action and the context and then combine them for action recognition. So this enable fine grain analysis because we can analyze the action and the context channel separately. Uh, our method makes use of the conjugate samples, uh, but conjugate samples are easy to collect. Um, Okay, so let me show you some experiment on uh, uh, on this framework. Now, so we uh, we perform this experiment on uh, uh, on the action threat data set, and so this data set contain about three thousand video clip of thirteen action classes. The set of action classes will be uh, will be shown in the next uh, slide. Basically, uh, so we did this work uh, quite. Um, uh, Quite long ago, actually, we started it. So at that time, uh, we used a C3D network for feature attraction. This network now, uh, you know, has been replaced by some other newer network for attracting feature vector for action recognition. So, for example, now the newer one that if you want to use, it would be I3D network. Okay, uh, but uh, for the C3D, the input to the network. Uh, um, is a block of 16 RGB frames, and this is a 3D convolution network, and it's going to output a feature dimension of 4096. Um, okay, so this is the list of the action, and what I'm showing you here is the average precision. Okay, uh, yesterday I talked about the average precision as a performance, which is the area under the curve of the precision recall for detection problem, okay? So, or it called AP. So the higher uh, the AP, the better, basically. Uh, so here we treat it as a detection problem, essentially, given a list of video, I want to retrieve all the video with some certain class first, like say for answer phone, for example, I want to rank all the answer phone clip before non-answer phone classes. So that, that the kind of evaluation in terms of uh, detection or ranking. So higher is better. Okay, so, so these are 13 different action classes and the columns show you different way of using conjugate sample. You might choose not to use a conjugate sample, uh, which is uh, the usual approach. Uh, you can use this as either negative, positive, or use this, uh, the negative uh, uh, conjugate sample as you in our framework. Okay, what you can see here, uh, on average, there's a significant improvement on average uh, in terms of AP. In many cases, you actually see a large performance gap between uh, the proposed approach and the baseline or the other methods. Right? Note that uh, if you use conjugate sample as positive or negative example, uh, might hurt the performance. Uh, for example, if you look at the last row, or you know the second last row of high five, you can see that you know if you use a conjugate sample as a negative example, then the performance would drop drastically. So high five is actually something quite very uh, very brief action. So in order to recognize the high five, it uh, you need a lot of context. So if you use the video sequence before and after high five as negative, it's going to uh, you're going to hurt the performance of the classifier. So it, it needs uh, context. Okay, uh, let me skip this. Uh, what do I say, want to say here? Um, yeah, oh, 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 I see. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I, what I just show you is the, um, uh, the result based on the O um, uh, the O uh, feature attraction pilot uh, C three D and if we use with conjugate sample, I call it factor C three D. The proposed and it improves the performance. Uh, if you want to switch to something a newer network like I three D for feature attraction, 
and you, you factor I3D uh, with conjugate sample, it also improves the performance a bit. Now, so let me uh, 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 show you some uh, qualitative example of the video clips that excite the action and contact channel the most. So what I'm showing here is uh, for answer phones, the video clips that uh, have very high score for the action components, and you can see that it corresponds to the answer phone. And uh, these are the clips that are not answer phone, but also have the high uh, uh, context component for answer phone. And so essentially what it says is that in this situation, they might uh, likely to answer the phone or something like that. Here's uh, some other action component or context component for uh, different uh, other action for hug, handshake, uh, sit off. For example, they say, okay, these two people are likely to hug each other. We can also analyze the uh, uh, pairwise differences between the context components. Uh, so we ask, you know, which is the other options that is most similar to uh, get our car classifier. Uh, among all the 13 actions, which one is most similar to get our car? So the plot here show you uh, the differences between uh, the, con the context differences. So the smaller the bar here means the highest the similarity between the pair of actions. Uh, okay. So get our car is obviously uh, similar to itself. So the next one that's similar to get out car is drive car in, in terms of context. And the next one that's similar to get out car is run. It's just uh, probably in uh, TV material when they have uh, like someone get out car, they start running. Okay, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a typical action scene basically, right? Uh, you can also see this is another the same uh, the same analysis, but for the kiss classifier. So hug is obviously contextually similar to kiss, and uh, as you can see, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so the role of context uh, feature now being able to separate action component from the context component give us some flexibility. We can tune the contribution of the context component for classification. So in this analysis, we, I just want to see the, um, the role of context for recognition. Now, if I pick a pair of class, uh, actions that are contextually similar with each other, for example, kiss and hug, then if, uh, uh, if you, you both action and context to try to separate them, it will be not as good as that using the action component alone, all right? But for the contextually dissimilar pairs, uh, then if you don't use the, if you only use the action, you only use the context, then it degrades the performance. So for contextually dissimilar pair between like kiss and it, you should use context for recognition, basically. Uh, uh, so essentially, I just, uh, I have finished the first uh, part on what I want to talk about, and I have one minute left, so I guess I should stop. Uh, ten minutes? Okay. Uh, all right, so let me. Uh, uh, okay, so let's move, um, let jump right in the second part. Okay, so. Um, now, so far, what I show you is uh, the proposed framework. Uh, and um, yeah, all right. So so far, what I show you in color is the things that connect with each other. Uh, for the next part of it, it's the same framework, but I'm going to just suppress the color so to highlight the differences. Okay, so let me just switch off the color for now. Now, so the input to this framework is a 3D array of d-dimensional vector. In this case, A in uh, action sample and conjugate sample, which uh, both of them are represented by uh, feature maps uh, coming out from a uh, uh, CNN. F A, G A, F C, and G C are k-dimensional feature vector uh, feature vector, and uh, 
uh, the function that we use to compare the similarity and differences are based on cosine distance. For example, the function to measure the differences between two vectors is uh, one minus the cosine between GA and GC. So we want GA and GC to be the same, so we penalize for uh, the differences between, uh, between them. Okay. Um, but there's some limitation of this approach. Uh, first of all, it does not support visual grounding. We don't know where action and contact voxel are. All right. So um, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that we propose to improve this approach is to replace the uh, instead of outputting a, a um, k-dimensional feature vector. What I want to output is a 3D array of uh, d-dimensional vectors instead. So, so it's going to preserve the, sp uh, the spatial information in the feature um, location. Okay? But if you want you replace FA, you, know, you, you formulate or is FA and GA as a 3D array of d-dimensional vector, one issue is uh, the cost function to measure the similarity or differences between two, uh, let's say, two voxels in this case, can no longer be as simple as the cosine distance. Uh, because this actually assume well, you can vectorize this, but it assume voxel to voxel alignment between two, uh, two feature maps. So what we propose here is we have a 3D array of d-dimensional vector, and we consider them at a set of d-dimensional vectors instead. And the intuition here is if hi is an action feature, uh, I should be different from O of uh, Z, Z, J. Uh, and if Hi is an ang, uh, action feature, uh, then Hi should be similar to sum of Z, J. Z, Z, Z. Okay. Z, Z. okay. Um, so to do so, we can measure the amount of uh, Hi in the set Z, J, and then we, uh, what we propose is a method to measure the similarity or the containment of a vector in a set. Uh, the one we need to come up with something that can be done efficiently in the uh, in the deep learning architecture, so that you can also uh, back propagate the gradient. Okay, so this is a specific formulation. Uh, all right, so this is a lot of thing. I think I'm going to skip all of this. Uh, that's a okay. So, um, so essentially, uh, what at the end, what we learn is uh, we have uh, we we was able to formulate this is as an attention map for the action component and the context components. So, what I'm showing you here is a network that learned to focus on the action component and also uh, also an attention map for the context component of the action clip. Uh, this is another example for uh, KISS, you know, the location of the, the action component and the location of the context. Here is also for two other uh, action eat and sit down. On the left is the one correspond to the action and on the right is the context. Uh, this, uh, let's skip all these boring numbers. Uh, uh, all right, I think uh, maybe I should, uh, if I want to explain it properly, I need more time than this. So I guess I should uh, stop here and then I take some question for the remaining time. Um, yes. Could you please go back to slide number 52 or 53? Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, 50, sorry, 51, yeah. So uh, for for the producing the heat map, did you use the uh, uh, grad cam? Did you use the grad cam or what kind of, yeah? Um, so no, we did not use a grad cam. Uh, essentially, in uh, we formulate our architecture in the sense that, you know, 
it has an attention layer that localize uh, the object, so it is built in in the network as an um, an attention mechanism. So you, one you can you can figure out what part of it correspond to. Uh, also, this is my uh, last lecture here, so thank you very much, and uh, I wish you uh, 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 you know the fruitful uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your summer school.